My name is Mary Catherine Froelich, and I am the host for Books and Brews. And this is exciting. This is the last of our series. And I feel like our timing has been amazing because the eclipse happened for this, <laughs> right? The wonder that we all felt, this cosmology that we felt, this is coming together right now in these two conversations. So let me introduce our uh, two authors here tonight, local authors, many of you may know them. Um, Greg Wren is the former Wallace Stegner Fellow at Stanford University and the author of Centaur, is that how you say that? Centaur, which poet Terence Hayes awarded the Brittingham Prize. Greg's work has appeared in The New Republic, Al Jazeera, The Rumpus, Kenyon Review, Keep Track, New England, Georgia Review, I Review, and elsewhere. As an associate English professor at JMU, he teaches, did we hear a woo there? All right, all right. <clears throat> he teaches environmental literature and creative writing, weaving climate change science into literary studies. He is a trained yoga teacher and a Padai advanced open water diver, having explored coral reefs around the world for over 25 years. Greg lives in the Shenandoah Valley with his husband and their growing family of trees. Yeah. Yes, we love that. He is here tonight to talk about his just released book. You guys are on a book launch, two of them. Uh, Mothership, a memoir of wonder and crisis. An evidence-based account of his turning to psychedelic rainforest plants and endangered coral reefs to heal from complex PTSD. Let's give Greg a warm <laughs> books and brews welcome. I, I feel like an Academy Award announcer up here, right? I'm gonna hand over some awards soon. So right next to him, our returning Sophia Samatar, who she said, this is now a tradition. Um, author of several works of fiction and nonfiction, including last year, we had a discussion about her memoir, The White Mosque. That's right. Winner of the 2023 Bernard J. Brommel Award for Biography and Memoir and a Penn Jean Stein Award finalist. Her works include the World, the World Fantasy Award winning A Stranger in Alondria, Monster Portraits, which we did on February 14th one year, a collaboration with her brother, the artist Del Samatar, and Tone, a study of literary tone with Kate Zambreno. Sophia Zamatar is a Roop, distinguished professor of English at JMU. We hear you again. Yes. Where she teaches African literature, Arabic literature, and speculative fiction. She is back for her third Books and Brews with the book, The Practice, The Horizon, and The Chain. And guess what? This is not even released yet. You are a pre-release tonight. Yep. And I'm gonna use her words to describe it because our, our uh, March Books and Brews, they were excited about this. A science fiction novella about a university attached to a prison in space. Yep. The best part is coming. It deals with issues concerning access and diversity in higher education, but in a fun way. <laughs> with mystical breath practices, asteroid mines, and rebellion. Let's give her a hand. <laughs> I think you guys have a good crowd. I think we do. Yes. So I'm gonna open with a quote that Greg has in his book from Rachel Carson, um, just to kind of bring us to last night or yesterday's eclipse. One way to open eyes to unnoticed beauty is to ask, what if I had never seen this before? What if I knew I would never see it again? How was your experience yesterday with the eclipse? 
fairly underwhelming. <laughs> I, I, I had a lot of emails to, to, to write, and so I, wasn't, I was not present for the eclipse the way I wanted to be. I know, it's really lame. I was there, my mic's not on. Oh, there we go. Um, a little cloudy. A little on the cloudy side. Almost yeah. all smoky. Yeah. Okay. So this is, this is gonna be better. A little wonder and crisis there, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Good, okay. So let's just start at the beginning. And I really, like, what was the spark for both, this is a question for both of you. And I'm gonna ask questions. I will just say this is an hour is not enough time. There's no way. Um, questions will, we're gonna go to you guys too for questions. And I have, I went through a process when I read it, both impactful, beautiful writing and so many questions. We're gonna try to concentrate on the similarities between the two books. So um, let's just talk about that beginning, that spark. Was it a spark or was it more of a slow idea that came to fruition? Greg, you want to start it? Well, it was actually a, a very long process. Um, uh, it took about 10 years to write. And I began writing this book thinking that it was going to be a work of environmental journalism, um, or maybe even s sort of experimental in its, in its forms. Um, and then I had some pretty incredible experiences underwater um, when the rest of the world's reefs were bleaching and dying. Um, this is at a miraculous place called Raja Ampat. And, um, and being there, it, it changed my life. It, it really opened up something in me, um, like a kind of sense of my own goodness, my, my own basic goodness. Um, and it also awakened trauma in me, yeah. memories of trauma. And so, um, so that, that ended up, I ended up going to the Amazon eventually and, um, and working with, with plant medicine there. And we'll, we'll talk more about that, but yeah. So a longer process for you. It was years. a long process. Yeah, it was, it, was, it was a long process. And I was changing, you know, I was, I was, I was evolving and flailing uh, during, during that time. Um, and then I, it, it, it became clear to me um, that I was writing a memoir, that I wasn't really writing as much about other people or about ideas, although my book does touch on those things, um, but that it, re it really was about my journey and being able to actually tell that story for the first time in a way that, um, that people could hear so that they wouldn't necessarily shut down I wanted to write about my trauma in a way that people could, where it could really land and in a sense be kind of awakened, I guess in sharing the, the roadmap of healing that, that I've created, I want people to be inspired to write their own, right? And, and not, to, not to necessarily duplicate mine. Um, so it, it's, a, it's, it's a really, it's a great question. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an involved question, yeah. yeah. Sophia, you, you were here last year, so. Was it a magic spark idea or? So um, my book did definitely come together uh, a lot faster. Fast for me uh, because I average nine years to write a book. But this one, this one was more like two, but it's also very small. Yeah. So um, and yeah, it's interesting, you know, hearing you mention, Greg, you know, ideas of, of trauma and, and personal experiences and personal trauma. This book was actually inspired by a national trauma, which was the murder of George Floyd. And in the aftermath, there was, um, and I don't know if you noticed this, but if you were at a uh, university or any kind of big institution, there was a moment where everything was suddenly rebranded as anti-racist, right? And um, it, it's, it's something that is very complicated and hard for institutions to do well. And I wanted to address, I wanted to address that. I wanted something to, I somehow needed to, you know, respond and struggle with that in a written form. But I felt very strongly that I also 
um, as you mentioned, I had said about the book, I also wanted it to be fun. So it is a space romp. It's sort of like it takes ideas and situations that are difficult and serious, and then it just is like mayhem. <laughs> that tells you. It is fun. It is, it is that. Um, let's go to that similarity in setting. Um, you all are both sort of addressing the environmental crisis, some interesting settings there. The cover of your book, Greg, it looks like an alien. So can you talk about where that is? What, what, ins what is that? Sure, what is this? Um, this is a barrel sponge that I encountered in about two and a half feet of water. And I had my GoPro handy and the water was perfectly still and um, and she was she was very sassy. <laughs> she was very very sassy, and she spoke to me. I, I, can't, I can't put it any other way. She she spoke to me. Um, quite a lady, I'll tell you. <laughs> quite a lady. And so, um, but yeah, you're right. I mean, it 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 does look like an alien, and it also to me looks like a wound. Um, and, it, and it looks like a, like a crater, like an impact crater from an asteroid or, or, or something like that, a ravaged piece of, of land or something. So um, I like to get up close and personal with invertebrates. <laughs> so why did you go to the Pacific and dive into yeah. these coral reefs? Well, first off, it was 10,000 miles from my family of origin, so that was handy. Um, there, was no, there was no Wi-Fi, there was no cellular service, um, and this, this location in Indonesia, these, this archipelago of islands um, off the coast of, of New Guinea, it shelters some of the last intact coral reefs on Earth. Um, and so as a native Floridian, as a, as a lifelong Floridian, I, um, I did a lot of snorkeling as a young boy, but those reefs were always dying. They were, they, were, they were diseased, they were still beautiful, but I knew that there was something really wrong with them, just like I knew there was something really wrong with the way I was being raised. Um, and so in some weird way, like, I, think that I, I thought that if I could, I could dive this, this reef that was virgin, all the trauma circuitry would just be pulled from my brain. Like it's it's magical thinking, right? But it's just it's just what I um, what 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 I came to, and so um, so I, I've been there several times, and uh, and I spent a lot of time I spent a lot of time there in silence, um, and I spent a lot of time there um, praying, and I spent a lot of time there writing, and just quieting my mind because where wherever I was in life at that time when I wasn't in Indonesia was mayhem. It was inner mayhem. So, yeah. Setting. Sophia, um, we know you're in space on your book. Um, talk to us about what happened to Earth, why, why are they in space, and how this whole ship is structured. What, what, what does it look like? Yeah, so I mean, that is definitely, I think, one of the connections between these two books is that my book is, my book is the aftermath. So by the time um, the practice, the horizon, and the chain takes place, we have ruined Earth. We can't live here anymore. Humans can no longer live here. So now we live on uh, uh, spaceships. We live in a space fleet and we do asteroid mining for resources, and we are basically floating through space, finding you know, a likely field of asteroids, sucking them dry, getting the resources, and then moving on, um, presumably forever. And in the book, um, I, well, the, the structure, each of these ships has the same kind of structure. There's a very strict, very severe caste system with three levels. And so there is an upstairs to the ship, and that's where um, the story is partially set at a university, which is up there. And the bottom is a prison. 
and it's just they're just attached together, floating through space forever. And a boy who is from the bottom comes up on scholarship to study at the university and meets a professor whose father had come from down below. And you know, this is where the mayhem comes in, is these two, you know, are are really thinking about thinking about structure and thinking about design and thinking about transformation. Um, but in terms of the of the environmental piece, um, these people, they're still human beings. So they have a language that developed on Earth, right? They have stories that they tell. And in those stories, there are really important images of the ocean, of the sea. After all, what they're in is called still called a ship. So they have language for things like oceans um, that they've never seen. And that's part of, you know, both the sense of loss, but also a sense of like, well, what what could that mean to us now? Or how could we imagine something that would be like that? It seemed in, in setting even a common theme for both of you was fragility, fragility of life. Um, and you go deeply into the coral reefs. Where are we at with that? It, it, it's sad to read. It's very sad to, it's really, really sad to read. And it's so, it would be so sad to be there in person that I can't do it. Um, I would. I don't think I could dive or snorkel in the Florida Keys um, these days, because, you know, we're down to one percent coral coverage in the Florida Keys. You know, the keystone species of coral uh, in the Western Hemisphere, staghorn coral and elkhorn coral, um, those are now critically endangered. You know, it, it that it's a, it's a keystone species. And and it's and now it's critically endangered, and so it's 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 quite bleak, quite bleak. And so I I guess in some ways coral, you know, because it is so sensitive, because it is so fragile, um, I feel drawn to it as a as a survivor. I feel I feel drawn to that fragility and see myself in it, and and have felt in the past endangered, um, but now I feel like a protected species. I guess you could say. I don't know. <laughs> well, that's good to feel protected, I think. <laughs> On the spaceship, um, you've got this interesting, you've got this great expanse of space, but again, you've got a group of people who are chained. Uh, how does that coexist? How does that happen? How does it happen that you have a bunch of people who are living their life in chains? How do you wind up with a whole bunch of people just in a prison behind bars? How did we get here? I don't know, but we took it with us to space, right? So, so this is part of what um, the, the story is examining is how, you know, Technology, because these people have very advanced technology. I mean, they can do all kinds of things technologically that we can't do right now. But socially, they are they they have not gone anywhere. They still have brought with them to space the same ideas that they had on Earth. And those ideas include things like, well, there's not enough. There's just not enough for everybody. Or, well, some people are just they're just extra. They're just surplus people. We don't have anything to do with these people. And that's how they wind up in the part of the ship that is called the hold, which is underneath, because shrug. And yet, they are, they're in space. And they have the capacity to get all the resources that they want from these asteroids that are So it's actually not a problem of space, it's a problem, it's a lack of creativity. And it's also, you know, as we discover, the fact that for some people, um, prison is very profitable. And that's, you know, it's the same thing on these spaceships. Um, so there are also, you know, people who are benefiting from having those people chained up uh, in the hold. And that maybe is the, is the saddest and simplest reason for why it exists. Right, how'd that work out for them on Earth? It was gone. <laughs> yeah, exactly. By the time we get to the story, Earth is gone. Yeah. Without giving 
giving anything away, so don't don't be worried. I read the book one time fully through, and then I had to read it again and again. So the nothing is being given away tonight. You will still feel like a journey. Both lo books look at social change um, and practices that get us to that social change. Greg's more on mental health and what issues and how we can look at it differently. And yours on caste systems and, and hierarchy and, and systems of inequality. Um, just talk about, um, were you channeling any of the university work that you currently do when you crafted your person, the professor? Somewhat. <laughs> um, she's a woman who's a professor and uh, is frustrated. Um, so maybe. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I actually didn't realize this. You know, the book was written in such a kind of very passionate rush. And it was only later, and you know, as it's coming out, I realized, oh, wait a second, you know, it's 2024, and I started uh, teaching in higher education, I started working in higher education. My first professor job, I started in 2013. Um, it was the 2013 14 school year. So I have realized that this book is, in some ways, a culmination of, of 10 years in higher ed and of doing a lot of diversity work in higher education, which often, you know, it's, it's so important and it's so necessary and it is like so small. I mean, it works like what they do on the ship, which is like, let's go and get one person from this situation and bring one person here. And then we're like, yay, us. And then it's like, and that's part of what, you know, the horizon part, has to do with, instead of having everything up down, what if you look horizontal, what if you look out and see things beyond just your school, your institution, your situation you're in, this one person you're bringing, and think about what would happen if we had like universal health care, just to say something bonkers, <laughs> right? Um, what if people were, what if we had that and what if we had like child care for everybody who was at the university? How, how much would that change? Like all this effort you're putting into getting that one person, how many people would, ac would actually come if those kinds of structures were in place? So it's that, it's, it's asking for, you know, as you're looking at like, the, really the kind of rewiring of the brain. It's like, how do you redesign a person? And this um, book is asking questions about how would you redesign a, a society? How would you redo those structures? Greg, on as I said to you earlier, I think you're the bravest person. I mean, reading this, really moving, and so brave of you to share. Um, so I just wanted if you would talk a little bit about your own personal trauma and really um, the different paths that you found out there t for healing. Wow, that's a, that's a very broad question, which gives me uh, a lot of latitude, thank you, um, to, to, to dodge um, all of it. Um, and, okay, well, zippity doo dah, okay. So um, I think that, um, you know, I was, um, I was abused by my mom uh, until I was 17. And I, I want you to know that because the search for Mother Earth takes on very, um, takes on a lot of urgency for me because there is the, the, the need, the burning desire, there has been the, the, the need, the burning desire to be remothered, to be reparented, um, to change the imprinting almost in my, in, 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 my, in, my, in, my, in my brain. And I know there are people here right now who know exactly what I'm talking about. I know, I know, I know that. Um, and so, um, 
I, I, you know, I'm not special. There's nothing special about me. Um, there's nothing special about my, my circumstances. But I, I offer that this story of like seeking Mother Earth to give people, a, I guess, another way to, to think about mental health. Um, and so, in, so where I found Mother Earth was underwater. And I found that I could stare Mother Earth face to face and forget about my body in the water. I could forget about my body there. I could see in creatures that, that you know, felt as endangered as, as I felt. Um, I could learn to, um, to open to beauty, to open to my basic goodness, which is the basic goodness of all human beings. It's that essence, it's that, it's that, that diamond that we all have in the center of our beings. Um, and so, and I will say being that open to the reefs and spending that much time with them by myself um, in these miraculously intact, you know, gorgeous coral reefs. If you're ever on my Instagram, you can see, you know, photographs of, that I've taken underwater, but so it, it also awakened a lot of trauma in me. It got, it got me, it kind of awakened, you could say, my inner child. And I didn't really know what to do with that. And I had to come back. You know, I had to come back to the United States. And um, I was walking a suicidal path. And what do you do when you feel suicidal? You go on Reddit. <laughs> you go on Reddit and you find an ayahuasca center with the most upvotes. <laughs> Because you've read Michael Pollan's Change Your Mind, and you feel, you, you feel like, well, if that guy can do this stuff, so can I. Sober, sensible Michael Pollan, right? And so I, my, my fingers just placed the deposit and, and booked, the, booked the ticket, and I went there, and I took a huge gamble. And this is why these medicines, some of these medicines need to be safe uh, and, and legal here in the United States because you shouldn't have to go to, to, this, to, to South America to save your life. And so I went there and I was very lucky and had an incredible experience, which I hope you'll read about. And I met face to face, once again, Mother Earth, but in the form of the entity of Madre Ayahuasca. And um, she began a long process of reparenting me, and there's, there's 70 um, peer-reviewed scientific journals that I weave into my book to kind of un so that the scientific basis for this reparenting force of the medicine so that, that case can be made, because I know there are going to be a lot of skeptical people. Um, and um, and that's, that's what I'll say for now. <laughs> there's so much to hear. Right. I don't think Michael Pollan got near the descriptions that you go to in all of these. They're amazing. Yeah. Um, naming of things, and I know I'm, I'm watching so we can get to your questions, so be thinking about them. Um, that seemed to be a common element with both of you of how you, um, some people were not named. They didn't develop names in your story. Your names would get so specific that they're Latin. And it was, what was it in naming? What was important about that? Well, in, um, in the world of the practice, the horizon and the chain, um, only the people who are in the top third of the society um, are named, are addressed by name. And that's not either of our two main characters. So through the whole book, the boy who comes up from below is referred to as the boy, and his professor is referred to as the woman, and he calls her professor. And there are other people who are, you know, guards, or just a person, or a student, or but they, they don't have names. Um, and there's a very, you know, there, it's, it's definitely a reference to um, sort of pressures and movements like Say Her Name, right, that have to do with naming people who have been victims of violence. 
um, uh, of state-sponsored violence. And, and so that's, you know, that's sort of what I'm, I'm working with in, in the story. And it was very interesting to write because you have, like, the woman and she's talking to somebody and they're like Marjorie, yeah. you know? And so it, 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 but to them, this is normal. And so it's, it's also a commentary on like uh, the human capacity to normalize things that are actually just like, you know, if you step outside of it, which I think is one of the things that science fiction helps us to do, you know, in the best cases, science fiction lets you get away so you can look at the thing and be like, if I was an alien and I came down from space and I saw this, I would be like, what are they doing? <laughs> right? Like, how did they come up with that? How are they, con don't they see? Yeah, it helps to get the outside view. How about your Latin names? Um... One of yeah, I'm trying to think of one tubercular. Anyway, I can't, can't I can't remember it. I'm not going to try and I'm like I'll, I'll mangle it. I'm sure, but I think I think well, I'm a trained poet, right? That that's that's who I really am. I mean, I have an MFA in poetry. I I I mean, this is the fact that I wrote a book of prose is rather miraculous because I never thought of myself as a storyteller, um, and so um, yeah, I think it. Um, yeah, that, that's what I'll say. Words, yeah. words, and poets important things. Yeah, just just every word counts, you know. And, and being specific is like to not be specific um, is somehow like a crime, you know. It, that's how I was. That's how I was schooled. Yeah. That point is when the poets write prose, like when the poets decide, I'm going to write a book of prose now. It's always like amazing. And I've read your book, and you, this is one of the most incredibly written books. I have read in a really long time. The prose of this book is extraordinary. I mean, it's you. If you like *The Road* by Cormac McCarthy, just the prose of that book, you will adore this book. I mean, this is an amazing, amazing book. Of that, yeah. we're going to give a little bit of time for them, for you all to hear, because that's an important element. So, um, before we go to questions, if you guys want to share just a, a parse of that beautiful prose. Read, I will read very, very briefly um, from the very beginning. So when you open the book, this is what you will see. The boy was taken upstairs without warning, unprotesting as he had been through all the changes in his 17 years. The shifts from cell to cell each time he outgrew the bolt on his ankle and the doctor came to exchange it for a larger one. An operation performed with a tool the hold people called the mallet, which jarred the whole leg and sometimes made the blood spray from the ankle bone and caused a sense of queasiness and superstitious awe in the boy who would glimpse for the instant during which the bolt and chain were removed, the shiny and alien looking patch of underexposed skin on his leg, which, according to the prophet, housed the seat of the soul. Okay, this is my first psychedelic experience, which was completely, completely an accident. And I was flirting with someone, and I said, are you a shaman? And next thing I know, I was in the forest smoking DMT. As I look, and, and remember what I said about mothers and mother earth here, okay, and reparenting. So this is the first experience. Um, oh, did I inhale. <laughs> My body dispersed like dandelion fluff. As I looked up at the trees, their new leaves turned into, into green fractals, and from them, like a magic eye poster, emerged a green face. Was it a female Buddha? She was gentle with the most serene, pleased smile. Being itself rang as it never had on silent meditation retreats. It was like a monk who had meditated for decades in a cave was sharing his mind with me. Reality came into focus. 
we're living in a simulation. But that isn't the right word. It makes our reality sound inconsequential and manipulative, almost evil. We're not virtual lab monkeys trapped on an alien server, spitting on my Harvard education, <laughs> spitting on my Harvard education, I saw the universe had been created. Time and space are a gift. So is having a body, even if it doesn't seem like it. Moving forward is an illusion. Holding on is useless. Looking up the green face, in the periphery, I saw the stitching and scaffolding of so-called reality. It wasn't a cage. It was form that had arisen miraculously, sassily, from formlessness. It was a classroom. It was art. The green face was the creator, the engineer, guru, goddess, mother of all. All right, we have time for questions. This is a conversation. How do we get out of language that is doomerism and into something that acknowledges where we're at but moves us forward? I mean, that's a really good question. And I think that doom is somewhat justified. Like if you identify with your body, <laughs> if you identify with your body, if your ego identifies with your body, then I think doom is, is um, it, it could be fairly appropriate. Um, but I think, you know, I, I think in discovering that I didn't have to be on a personal suicide mission, I guess I also think our civilization doesn't have to be. And the word that gives me the most hope in the English language is neuroplasticity. We can change. We can change. We can change, and we are changing, just in a lot of different directions. So I think that, um, I, think, I think that there are eight billion brains, I know there are about eight billion brains on this planet, and we have to first take responsibility for our brains. What happened to us was not our fault, but it is our responsibility. Right, the, the 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 Gen Z, they're inheriting and, and younger, you know, they're inheriting a world that we don't, they shouldn't be inheriting. But it's so it's not their fault, but it it is their responsibility. It is our responsibility to deal with the crisis. And in dealing with the crisis, you're gonna feel doom, and you're gonna talk in 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 doom doomy doomy <coughs> ways. <laughs> and, but. There's also, there's also love. There's also love that transcends having a body. There's love that transcends whether there's a fire raging out, out, outside or there's a dance party, right? Like, I just think that our destiny is bound up in rejoicing. I believe that. And that's what keeps me going. But I definitely say things that are rather pessimistic sometimes. What was, what was the hardest part about writing your books? Sophia, you want to start with that one? Sure, yeah. I think, um, I think the hardest part was probably my uh, fake science. <laughs> it's still fake, <laughs> but it has an aura of... I looked up some stuff. <laughs> um, but definitely, you know, because because there is a they, there is a sort of mystical, I mean the practice of the title, right? So you know the chain is the people are chained up. The horizon is like this effort to look for, you know, thinking that's not so vertical. The practice is a kind of mystical breath practice that these people do. And it turns out that because there's carbon in your body, and there's also carbon in everything else, pretty much, if you can harness 
mystically the power of the carbon in your body, then you can like have telekinesis and telepathy and all of these things by forming this like chain of carbon. The hardest part was, you know, reading all the things about the carbon and being like, yeah, I think, you know, with some effort and time, like this would be possible. I'm so glad that she's several doors down. It's nice to have her as a neighbor. Um, I would say the hardest part of this book was I guess remembering all of it. Remembering all of it and deciding what to put in and what not to put in because there's a lot that is not <laughs> in the book. Um, and so that, so remembering was difficult, but then like deciding what to put in, what not to, that was, yeah, that, 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 that was, that was, that was challenging. And, um, um, but I think I'll just, if I could, just the best part of writing this was coming to clarity, right? Like finally coming to clarity um, and finally being able to kind of connect my story with that of the collective. Like that was really, that was really empowering and it made me feel less alone. But that was hard, that took a long time to get to. But I, I got to a point of, of some level of satisfaction that I had hit that and you know, and now I'm just throwing it out into the world and seeing, seeing who who will bite. So the question of what journeys did you have to go to to go from poetry to prose, or from your memoir to science fiction? Um, so for me, I I started in fantasy my first couple of books. So in some ways. Um, the practice, the horizon, and the chain is a return for me after branching into memoir. But um, there still is a difference between fantasy and science fiction. And I, you know, this is my first kind of, I've done short stories, but this is my first kind of longer um, piece that really engages with the genre of science fiction. Um, it was, it was an, an enormous amount of fun for me. Um, I loved coming back to fiction, and I also loved um, doing something that has kind of, um, that really has that, the, the genre feeling. You know, it has the stuff, like the spaceship, and the thinking about, like, how does time work on the ship, and when is it light, and when is it dark, and what do, you know, wh where is the water, and how do they get it, and um, those kind of things were just, were were a lot of fun, honestly. So it was not, um, it was not an arduous process at all. This change from poet to prose writer was, that was fairly seamless. Like I just, at first it was seamless, like to actually stop writing poetry and start writing paragraphs, like that was pretty seamless. But what was really rocky was, um, was learning to tell a story. I always felt like I was terrible at telling stories growing up. I wrote these really lame short stories in, in high school, or excuse me, elementary school on a typewriter. And I never felt like I was, I, w I was good at it. And I wasn't, I was terrible. I wrote a novel, which is, you know, never saw the light of day, thank goodness. Um, <laughs> oh, whoa, it's, it's really quite racy, yes. Elementary. Yeah, well, yeah. I'll tell you some other time. So I felt very insecure about that, but then I think when I started to work with plant medicines, when I started to work with psych psychedelics, um, ayahuasca, um, I, well, well, what that does for you, that's a control alt delete for your brain when you're in a safe um, container. And so, and it opens critical periods of development in someone. So the critical period for storytelling had long since closed and what the medicine did was reopen it. And then I was, I, I started to, to just really read memoirs and I actually worked with a couple of teachers remotely when I was in Peru, um, uh, just, just some, some friends back home who, who, who 
you know, write memoir. And I started just kind of apprenticing myself to them and, and getting their feedback. And it just happened really rapidly. So, um, so maybe, maybe I'll write a novel. <laughs> set in, set at JMU. What's it like to have all your business out there for everyone to know, having written memoirs? Well, mine, mine came out almost two years ago, and yours is very new, Greg. Exactly two, exactly two weeks. So let me tell you what is going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Will I start to sweat a lot? <laughs> and Yes, there's that. Yeah. Um, here's what I found so interesting and actually quite wonderful in a way about publishing a memoir which I had never experienced this before you have told your story and that you know for for the humans it's an exchange like we tell stories when we're talking together when we're hanging out together it's not a one-way street it's not like one person is at the table as a storyteller and everybody else is just listening when I, in my experience publishing a memoir makes other people want to tell you their stories. And so you get some really long emails. <laughs> you also get books that just come to your house because somebody wants to send you their memoir. You know, they, they read yours and they're like, I want to share my story with you. And I never had that. I never had that experience when I was writing fiction. So I'm sure there will be people, you know, who have connected with your experience, who have had some of those experiences or who have questions, you know, um, or who want to know more about where you went and what happened. I mean, it's get ready. <laughs> well, I, I think that, um, I think it is hard, you know, it, it, it is hard and I could not do it without my incredible husband. <laughs> some of you know, <laughs> some of you know Tony. Um, I, I couldn't. I could not do it without him, um, and I think of this as one long, one long ayahuasca ceremony <laughs> without the puke bucket. Um, that will not suffice. Um, so <laughs> I assure you, <laughs> no, no, no. Bring, bring the pitcher. Um, so I, yeah, I, I think of this as like part of. Like this is this, this is the ceremony of life, and um, you know, because the point of drinking medicine is not to drink more medicine, right? That the point of drinking medicine is so that you can live your life with more freedom and with more choice, and you can activate open-heartedness even when you're not, you know, on, on the medicine. And so, um, that uh, that seems important. Yeah. Question being, most people are resistant to change unless it comes from within. Did you think about that into how your reader would, would take the change? I did not think about how to persuade my reader. Um, and that's partly because the reader that I was imagining as I was writing the book was some really tired person who works in higher education <laughs> and is, is in some meeting and something is supposed to happen from this meeting and everybody is in the meeting with the best intentions in the world because they really believe that change is needed and they're all sitting there and it's taking their time and absolutely nothing is changing. And they are just very discouraged and demoralized. And my idea was that there would be this little book and they would have it in their bag and they'd be like, mm-hmm, yeah. They'd be like, I feel seen because here is a space romp that is like telling my life but giving it a different ending. So it was much less thinking of persuasion than it was just thinking of like solidarity and like, yeah, like we're in this and this is hard and this is going kind of nowhere and we're all really down about it. Um, but look, 
<laughs> maybe you can connect to the carpet anyway. Right. <laughs> um, but but yeah, that it would be it was more of like solidarity and and just a sense of of being together rather than than a feeling of persuasion. But I don't know about you. Well, I think I was strategic about some things. Um, I, I actually want people of all political backgrounds to be able to read my book, um, which I know is probably a very tall order. Um, so there were things I took out, actually, to make it just a little bit less, um, to make it just a little bit more, I guess you could say, politically ecumen ecumenical. Um, than um, than maybe I would have liked, but that's really at the beginning. I feel like as the as the as the book goes on, I um, you know I, I do you know I am very clear about how I feel about certain presidents, <laughs> um, and so. But you know, yeah. So there there is a lot in the book that someone could sort of be, I guess, if you were from a polit certain political orientation that you might be a little triggered by. But what I do is I emphasize the oneness of all, all, all beings, right? I emphasize our, the essential nature that we share. And so they may get triggered, but I think they still keep reading because they want to know, is he really going to do this? Is he really going to, really going to do this? Like I read the the reviews, I, I, someone told me what the book was about. I wanna, does this really happen? So I think even someone who is maybe less, shall we say, invested in climate change, they might, um, they might still get through it and, and sort of take what they need and leave the rest. That's my hope, that's my hope. Because it's too important for just 52% you know, of us to, to, to be on board with, it's too important. It has to be all of us, or almost all of us. We are at the final hour here. I, do you, is there anything else you want to leave us with, either one of you, the readers? or in, I just want to say, get the book, because it's an amazing, uh, both to have fiction and nonfiction addressing, and to write so beautifully, and to go for that fun romp, and that other fun journey. <laughs> it's amazing. So thank you so much.